Hello everyone, and welcome to this video on bones, their structure, and their healing. So first, let's talk about what the bones are themselves. And they have a unique extracellular matrix. And 70% of this component is an inorganic mineral. And this mineral is known as uh, hydroxyapatite. And this is where all the calcium gets stored within our body. Most of the body calcium is in bones. And the stuff that you see in blood tests is just free calcium. It's maybe less than 1% of all circulating calcium. We also have water. So these are made up of water, 5%. Whereas, you know, tendons and cartilage have a high water content, but this is water. And we also have the organic components. And let's elaborate on those. For, so for the organic components, we have collagen type 1 mainly, which is 90%. We have non-collagen proteins, uh, which made a cup 5%. These are like gags and proteoglycans, which give flexibility and tensile strength to the bone. And then we have 5% cells. The collagen type 1 is the primary type of collagen found in bone. And it's packed into these sort of these sheaths and into parallel lines. And it's this strength, this tensile strength of collagen that gives bones their strength. And the non-cellular components of bone are called osteoid, and the cellular components are just on their own. So let's dive deeper into the cellular components. So from what we see, we have osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. And I've done them in different colors because osteoblasts and osteocytes come from a common osteoprogenitor cell. And they sort of come from the bone, from within the bone. Whereas osteoclasts come from hematopoietic stem cells. And they're more from an immunological derivative. A simple way to sort of remember these functions is that osteoblasts build bone, so B and B. And osteocytes maintain bone. Now a little bit more about osteoblasts. So osteoblasts are very circular compared to the osteocytes and they are the ones who primarily secrete collagen, fibers and other organic compounds that might be needed to build the extracellular matrix of the bone. They also help initiate calcification. Osteocytes are mature osteoblasts that have become osteocytes uh, once they get surrounded by ECM. And these projections, this is how we differentiate them, they have these projections, osteocytes. Um, and they're long and elongated, and their function is to maintain the bone. And they do this by responding to the various metabolic and physical changes um, that occur within the bone. This is due to the fact that when we apply force on the bone, um, those, these cells detect it. And they also ensure that the nutrients are delivered to the right parts of the bone. Uh, that's them. Then we have osteoclasts. And osteoclasts are derived from monocyte-type cells. And they all fuse together, so it's a multicellular sort of cell type, as you can see. And they are usually much bigger, so these are not to scale, but these osteoclasts will be much bigger. What you can see is that they have this ruffled border, this unique property called the ruffled border. And this border ensures uh, that you can release powerful lysosomic enzymes that break down the ECM and resorb calcium ions. These are the cells that are responsible for releasing calcium from ions. Uh, from the bones, uh, such as the case in hungry bone syndrome. And the function of this is to break down the ECM and to resorb these calcium ions, and it's important in maintaining the bone by breaking down all tissue. So following our sort of naming structure, we can say that these bones, so these cells carve the bone, because it's osteoclasts, that's a C. And here's a picture of them sort of working in tandem. So you have the osteocytes within the bone, this is calcified bone matrix. They help maintain it. You have osteoclasts which come in and resorb the bone, the osteoid. And then osteoblasts that come in to sort of um, help maintain and rebuild what the osteoclasts have carved out. So three bones, uh, three bone cells. Two of them are osteoprogenitor and the other are osteoclast. There's different types of bone as well. So we have, on the one hand, we have compact bone or cortical bone. And on the other side, we have cancellous or trabecular bone. And the compact bone sort of lies directly beneath the periosteum of all bones, right? And it makes up the bulk of the diaphysis in long bone, so it's this component here. And they're packed in units called osteon. So this right here is an osteon, these little circular structures, osteons. 
And the way this works is that they are built and carved into the direction of force. So they're aligned with the direction of force. So when you weight bear on a, with your hip, and you stand and you run and move, the bones get adapted to it. And the thing is, is that each osteon has this artery, right? A haversian canal. And around this haversian canal, I'll show you a picture later, um, all the bone matter so sort of forms around it. And they have something called a lamellar structure. And a lamellar just means that it's in sort of uh, circles like an onion, right? Different sort of layers. And the ECM, the extracellular matrix, gets mineralized by the osteoblasts um, to form these osteoids. As you can see, the osteoblasts line the cells. We have an osteoclast right here. And then we have osteocytes within the uh, oste osteoid. And what's important here with the osteoid is that we have blood vessels, so that's your artery, vein, lymphatic vessels, and nerves within the bone. Now, as you can see, these come from the periosteum, so from the outside of the bone, or in the tissue that aligns the bone, and they sort of divert in to the cortical bone. And this, you know, there's many sort of channels and many sort of out, sort of pouchings of this blood vessel. Um, and they sort of form around and create these units called osteons. Now, the osteoblasts are found in these sort of lacunae, as you can see here. And once the osteocytes become mature and projectiles, they enter these canaliculi. And the canaliculi is just canals. And they communicate. You see, they touch with each other with their projections, as we saw before. And in this way, they can sort of maintain the bone microenvironment. And then on the other hand, we have cancellous or trabecular bone. And this is the bone that's found closer towards um, so the, so the heads of the long bones. And it's more in the internal aspect of the bone. And these are in areas where stress is not heavily applied. So they usually form epiphyses because the stress is not really there. And they're always beneath the compact bone. They also line the medullary cavity. So you can see here medullary canal would be here and the medullary cavity would be lined with these um, with this bone and their units are trabecular bones as you can see here this is a trabecular bone unit and they have trabeculi and these trabeculi are just sort of little outpouchings and little um, not even outpouchings but structures which are quite thin they're not as strong as and densely packed as the cortical bone and they form irregular columns rather than osteons, which are very regular. And they're found sort of outside of the lacunae. So the osteoblasts here are found outside of the lacunae, and they're sort of with they exist within these trabecular bones. The osteoclasts are found nearby because this trabecular bone is very metabolically active. What that means is that it undergoes a lot of bone turnover. So their osteoclasts are always nearby, and these bones always get remodeled. So here's a sort of basic table for the compact bone. Oh, for the compact bone. And what we have here is that the compact bone, once again, is under periosteum in the diaphysis, whereas the cancellous bone or the trabecular bone is under the compact bone. We have an osteon, that's the unit, whereas they have no units here, it's just irregular trabeculi. The function is to provide strength, thickness, and they grow in lines of stress, whereas here the bones are these the bones act to reduce the overall weight of the bone. As you can see, they're very sort of, I wouldn't, you wouldn't call them hollow, uh, but they don't, they're not as densely packed as the compact bone. And so more importantly, from a physiological standpoint, they're in, they protect and support the red bone marrow. Osteoblasts here are found in the lacunae, whereas here it's outside of the lacunae, and the osteocytes reside within the canaliculi. Whereas here, they're inside of the lacunae, so the inside of these. So let's talk about woven and lamellar bone, right? So woven and lamellar bone um, are different from compact and trabecular, and it's to do with the way the collagen is deposited. So as I said before, um, this is a woven bone, so this is the bone that gets initially produced by osteoblasts, and it's very haphazard, as you can see. And in the previous video, when I talked about collagen deposition and tendons, it's very similar to that. It's very haphazardly deposited collagen fibers. It's mechanically weak, 
because these are the blood vessels we see and we would expect osteons to be densely packed around them. So this is sort of immature bone, so to speak. Then we have lamellar bone, right, which is much stronger and they have these lamellae, which if you can think of them like onions, sort of with many layers. And each of these layers are osteocytes, these little dots. And these are very important because they contain the regular alignment of the collagen, which is mechanically strong and is in line with the forces um, that you will sort of experience on the long bone. So once again, woven bone produces osteo rapidly. This is usually initially in fetal bones. Um, and it's usually replaced by lamellar bone, but also after fracture, woven bone is first remodeled, is first created, and then remodeled into lamellar bone. And in adults, in healthy adults, virtually all bones should be lamellar bones. So next we're going to talk a bit about bone biology. So the first thing here is we have a stromal cell. So this is another type of cell I didn't talk about, but these cells are found within the bone tissue. These are supportive cells that you might find in many other connective tissues and musculoskeletal tissues. And they reside everywhere. Any organ will have these stromal cells. And these make up the stroma, which is the surrounding bone tissue. And what that does is it attracts all these osteoblasts to come to the site. And it does that it stimulates them to produce collagen type 1 and osteoid. And these eventually become osteocytes and you know become incorporated within the woven bone. At the same time though, we have these monocytes, these immune cells. And the osteoblast produces rank L, which is a rank ligand, macrophage colony stimulating factors, MCSF, and Wnt, alongside with many other interleukins. And out of the presence of these, these monocytes eventually differentiate into osteoclasts. And it stimulates this differentiation, particularly the macrophage colony stimulating factor. And what happens here is that essentially, once these osteoclasts become mature enough, they start producing captasin C, as uh, captasin K, MMP, and TGF beta. And all of these promote the resorption of woven bone. And calcium. So this bone gets resorbed and eventually what should happen is that it becomes broken down so they can be reformed again by osteoblasts. So we can break down bone biology into two separate factors which is bone formation which is osteoblasts and osteocytes and bone resorption. And here we have also calcium release so the release of calcium from bones is mediated by osteoclasts. And when these work together, we call that bone turnover. So once again, to recap, it's the balance between bone formation and bone resorption. For bone resorption, it's osteoclasts, and they produce metalloproteinases, captasin K, and other factors that promote breakdown and release calcium. And at the same time, we have bone formation by osteoblasts. Now we have different sort of factors that can influence um, osteoclast activity. And what sort of increases their activity is things like parathyroid hormone, and does that by inhibiting, uh, by stimulating um, rank L. Also glucocorticoids, which increase rank L formation, and calcitriol, which is activated vitamin D, which stimulates rank L once again. So all of these stimulate rank L. Then we have things that sort of decrease their activity. So the main factor that decreases osteoclast activity is osteoprotegrin. And this is called OPG. And what OPG does is that it binds uh, to rank L, which prevents osteoclast differentiation. So it binds to the rank L and inhibits it. Now there's many different things which can increase osteoprotegrin. We have estrogen, which increases the concentration of this. We also have bisphosphonates, which interfere uh, with osteoclast activity directly. So next we're going to talk about sort of bone healing after like a fracture. And with any tissue, we follow the simple sort of mnemonic IRR, which means we get initial inflammation, which is six to eight hours in. And this is your fracture hematoma gets formed here. So all the inflammatory tissue comes from the bones, blood comes out, and causes a swelling, causes a hematoma. 
And this is due to immune cells releasing their cytokines and cause inflammation at the fracture site. It's not really pertinent to know which of cytokines cause this, um, but what, what suffice to know is that they cause this hematoma. The platelets become activated underneath all this, uh, under the immune cells as well, and they help sort of prevent the bone from bleeding out. And this is very important because the bone is a very vascular organ, as we can see with all these different blood vessels here. So it's a very vascular organ. It's very important to keep it intact. So that's why you have a hematoma. Then we have the repair phase, which can take three weeks to four months. And it starts at after three weeks of after fracture and can last up to four months. And now this is broken down into sort of two separate phases. The hematoma will get organized into this granulation tissue, which is called a soft precallus. So this is like a fibrocartilaginous callus. And this is because the fibroblasts, they come from the local tissues and they invade uh, this hematoma. And they call, create this sort of fibrocartilage, right? They these fibroblasts and you know they lay out down this weak um, structure to sort of keep the bone together in the meantime, and then eventually, you know the trabecular bone starts first. It's the spongy bone, and then new blood vessels form within to sort of help support the healing, and eventually we form a bony callus, and the bony callus starts when the osteoblasts invade the tissue, and they form woven bone to replace the fibrocartilage. And since the fiber cartilage is very weak, your bone will not you know, suffice there. And this is why it's quite painful, the bone, because of all these blood vessels forming inside. So it's quite painful. And in this case, we want to immobilize this, because if you can imagine, if this becomes out of line, then it's not going to heal properly. And this occurs up to four months, so this bony callus formation. And you can sometimes see it on x-ray, and I'll show you some pictures after that. Now we have remodeling, and this is where we get the osteoclast to remodel this woven bone into compact and trabecular bone. And because you can see the fracture starts to heal, we still get some edema here, some blood vessel problem here, but it takes 4 to 12 months, if not longer, depends on the bone that was uh, fractured. So it takes a long time for these fractures to heal and to be fully remodeled. There's very important healing factors for fractures, so we can split that into patient factors, and then we can split it to sort of other factors. So for patient factors, if you're older, you're going to have a poorer blood supply, and it's not going to heal as well. If you smoke or drink, especially smoking, that's going to mean that your blood supply is not as good. And with alcohol, you're at high risk of falling and repeating the fracture. Same thing with anemia, that means your blood vessels do not oxygenate enough but there's also a false risk associated with this. Hypoparathyroidism, as we've mentioned, PTH is responsible for osteoclast activity. If it's low, as in you don't produce enough, then the osteoclasts are not going to be able to remodel, and that final stage of bone healing is going to be interrupted. And then we have diabetes as well, which just raises the sugar in your blood and makes for worse healing. We also have medication, so we have NSAIDs. So NSAIDs inhibit vascularity, they do that everywhere, kidney, bones as well. The fracture site, which means less blood supply, poor healing. Then we have steroids. Steroids inhibit osteoblasts, because we talked about this, glucocorticoids. Same thing with bisphosphonates. So if someone has osteoporosis and they're taking bisphosphonates, it will inhibit osteoclast activity, which will delay healing. So we have fracture healing, and there's two different ways we can have fracture healing. We can have direct, which is what we want with surgery, and we can have indirect. So direct, the difference is, is that direct has no callus formation. And the reason for that is, is because it will take longer and it won't be aligned properly. As you can see here, this is misaligned. So we want to surgically fixate this with screws, plates, and whatnot. And after that, they sort of get removed here, as you can see. And the goal here is to have bone formation to restore skeletal continuity. So you want anatomical continuity. Um, and there, that means that there's no movement and you need to have stable fracture. So this can't be in two million pieces. You need to have stable fracture. Then we have indirect healing, which is a sort of natural healing we were talking about. 
And that's just the formation of bone through this callus and all the other tissues until skeletal continuity is somewhat restored. And this could be done with, um, if it's quite close, like in a cast. But as you can see, the risk here is that it doesn't form properly. And this is the sort of fibrocartilaginous osteophyte uh, calyx that we're talking about. That's right here. So to summarize, the bone is made of cancellous and cortical components. Um, the cortical bones are made up of osteons. Um, and these osteons contain uh, trabecular networks as well in this type. But more importantly, these osteons have these mineralized collagen fibrils. Same thing with the trabecular network. It's in areas where there's not a lot of force. And this trabecular network forms single trabecular, which also has collagen fibrils. In between these collagen fibrils, we have hydroxyapatite, which is our calcium crystal, which is why calcium is in the bones. We have three main bo uh, cell types, the osteoblasts, which build our bones, osteocytes, which maintain our bone, and osteoclasts, which carve the bone. These two come from an osteoprogenitor cell, and osteoclasts come from an immunological cell line. Bone turnover involves the balance between resorption of bones and building of bones. The balance tips towards osteoblasts uh, for building and then back uh, to osteoclasts. The osteoblasts build the new bone, which is the woven bone. This is a sort of structurally weaker bone. And mechanical stresses and forces ensure that the osteocytes maintain and remodel the bone in accordance with these forces. This all starts over with osteoclasts as the micro damage that is sustained through these forces and requires resorption and then the, uh, the osteoblasts rebuild it. Eventually we, we achieve this quiescence phase which um, is just a balance between the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. Finally, in fracture healing we have the inflammation repair and remodeling model. Inflammation causes the hematoma to be formed. In the repair, we have fibrocartilaginous callus first, which then later ossifies. And the remodeling the woven bone, the immature bone, becomes compact and cancellous and becomes differentiated. Fracture healing can be both direct and indirect. And in the direct, we want proper surgical fixation as seen here. So we move, we reduce it, and then we fix it. And here is natural direct with a bony callus. And all in all, this is a sort of summary of bones, how they heal, and the metabolism. Thank you very much for watching.